All right, I want to talk about the shape of the world that we live in. We all know the symbol of the atom, right? The electrons are orbiting the nucleus, and they're all on different planes. Well, this is how I imagined the solar system when I was a child, and I thought I was being clever and intuitive, imagining the orbits of the planets fully utilizing 3D space. Well, I was dead wrong, and this is what the solar system really looks like. Now, to further illustrate this, I'm going to delete everything that doesn't weigh a lot, the smaller rocks and asteroids, and leave you with just the sun and the planets. From this perspective, of course, the planets are so tiny that you wouldn't even be able to see them at all. So I've added trails to indicate what their orbits look like. So I found that the explanations out there about why the solar system is so flat have been overly complicated and don't quite get to the point. So I decided to do some research on my own and come up with a way better, more visual explanation of the shape of our reality. And this is how the solar system really works. Scientists say that 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system was just the shape of a cloud. As the time went on, the cloud's gravity pulled inwards and inertia pushed outwards and the matter began swirling around, eventually becoming a disk. We call this disk a protoplanetary disk, and through our telescopes right now, we can even see other planetary systems that are forming. Now the conclusion I drew from all of my research is that the flatness of our solar system can really be simplified down to the fact that it's spinning. Now the spinning of course is caused by gravity and the inertia that comes with it. But in this video, I want to talk about why a spinning motion flattens things out. And we're going to talk about mass and gravity and how they affect the shape of the objects in our solar system. At the end of the video, I'll try not to blow my own mind talking about the galaxy, or as I now call it, the Grand Frisbee. So for now, think about the solar system as a single object. Sure, there's tons of space within this object, and the planets all orbit the sun at different speeds, but everything in our solar system is connected by the sun's gravity. So in terms of the mass of our entire solar system, the sun contains 99.8% of it. 99.8%. The sun is so massive that scientists have called our solar system the sun plus some debris. And the reason mass is so important is because mass is directly proportional to gravity, meaning the more massive an object is, the more gravity force it pulls inward with. Jupiter, the next most massive object, accounts for only six hundredths of a percent of the mass of our solar system. That's 0.06%. But it's still gargantuan compared to the Earth. In fact, it's as massive as 318 Earths put together. Its mass is more than twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And don't be fooled by Saturn's size. Jupiter is way denser and has much stronger gravity than Saturn. Now compared to the Sun, yeah, Jupiter is just a speck. But compared to the rest of the matter in our system, the force of Jupiter's pull is so strong that it affects satellite trajectory calculations. Jupiter's gravity pull even affects the Sun. Jupiter does not orbit the very center of the Sun, because while the Sun's center of mass is dead center in the core of it, the center of mass of Jupiter and the Sun combined is a point right outside the Sun's surface. Basically, think of Jupiter and the Sun as one object, with a lot of space in between them, obviously, but if they were just one object, how would that object spin? Well, the Sun and Jupiter actually do a little dance, revolving around a point in space we call the barycenter of Jupiter's orbit. You may be thinking, wait, this looks crazy. Well, it's true, but keep in mind that it takes 12 Earth years for Jupiter to make a complete orbit around the Sun, and for the Sun to do its little wobble. Now let's talk about planes. You know what a plane is from geometry, right? Since humans started looking up at the stars and planets, we have all agreed that our home star system is basically flat, meaning most of the mass in our solar system orbits the Sun on pretty much the same plane. We call this plane the invariable plane. None of the planet's orbits are exactly aligned with the invariable plane, because the invariable plane is essentially a weighted average of all of the orbital planes in our solar system. Jupiter's orbital plane is currently 0.32 degrees offset from the invariable plane, while Earth's orbital plane is 1.57 degrees off. When I say offset, I'm talking about the difference in how an orbit is tilted. A more sophisticated term for this would be orbital inclination. 
the one planet that has the most inclined orbital plane is Mercury at 6.3 degrees offset from the invariable plane. Aside from this one oddball, the flatness of the rest of the planets is remarkably thin. I mean, look at Earth's orbit. It's less than 2 degrees inclined from the invariable plane, and because we live on Earth, we've given Earth's particular orbital plane a name, which in my opinion is a delightful name. It's called the Ecliptic Plane. I actually wanted to name this video the Ecliptic Plane, but it's just not as relevant to the shape of our solar system as the invariable plane, even though it's only 1.57 degrees offset. Our very own orbital plane is called the ecliptic plane because any object that crosses this plane has a chance of being involved in an eclipse with the Earth and the Sun depending on where the Earth is in its orbit. Check out this diagram that shows the difference between the ecliptic plane, the Earth's equator, and our Moon's orbital plane around the Earth. If you ever look up at the sky using a smartphone app like Sky Maps, you'll see a line across the sky labeled ecliptic. It's a little disorienting because we're on the surface of a planet that's spinning, but it's cool to see all the planets line up on this line because the ecliptic plane is so close to the invariable plane, and by extension, the orbital planes of the other planets. There are other types of planes too, like Laplace planes, which are also a type of average plane, and each planet has its own equatorial plane. Even though the sun is a star, it spins too, and it has its own equatorial plane and equator, of course. Its equatorial plane is actually only a few degrees off from the invariable plane, which tells us that the sun isn't tilted very much compared to the shape of the entire solar system. I love this real footage of the sun spinning, by the way. Now that we're talking about equatorial planes, let's talk about the gas giants. All four of the gas giants in our solar systems have rings, not just Saturn. And part of the beauty of our solar system is that rings and inner moons tend to orbit around the equators of their parent planets. Jupiter's inner moons look like a mini solar system. Now, it's different story for Jupiter's outer moons, which orbit Jupiter like this, in more of a loose shape. Same thing with Saturn and the other gas giants. Uranus, by the way, is totally bonkers. Its orientation in relation to the rest of the solar system is actually similar to the solar system's orientation in relation to the galaxy, which we'll talk about in a minute. But just check out how cool it is that it's basically on its side, causing its inner moons to orbit nearly perpendicular to the invariable plane. In general, inner moons and rings usually orbit on or very close to a planet's equatorial plane, while outer moons tend to orbit in a sphere shape or closer to a planet's orbital plane around the sun. This makes sense because the parent planet's gravity pull is stronger on the closer moons but weaker on the farther moons, while the sun's gravity influence on all of these moons remains the same whether or not the moons are close or far from their parent planet. There's actually a similar phenomenon to this going on when you look at our solar system as a whole. As you get farther and farther away from the center of our system, things start to become less flat and a bit more three-dimensional. Even though objects so far away from our sun don't reflect enough light back at us to give us hard evidence, the theory is that the solar system is surrounded by many, many objects that form a shape that looks much more like a sphere than a disk. This theoretical region is called the Oort Cloud. Okay, okay, wait, let's back up and get back in here closer to home and talk about the shapes of individual objects in our solar system. Have you ever heard of Eros? How about Ceres? Well, they're both big old rocks that orbit the sun, and they're both featured in Amazon's awesome sci-fi show, The Expanse. Shown here are 3D renderings that are not at all to scale. But one big difference between Eros and Ceres is that Ceres looks like a ball, and Eros looks like a foot. Or perhaps a potato? While gravity is a mysterious force that scientists haven't really quite figured out on micro and macro scales, at the scale of our solar system, we can calculate the force of gravity quite precisely, and we know that the more mass an object has, the more gravity force it pulls things inwards with. I'm saying inwards because we need to think of things three-dimensionally. Assuming you're watching this on Earth, from your perspective, the gravity is pulling you down. But from the Earth's perspective, Earth's gravity is pulling you inwards, towards the core of the Earth. And gravity doesn't just pull on foreign objects, the source of the gravity pulls inwards on itself too. It's self-gravity. I know it's a bit mind-mending, but just think of it as a very slow implosion or collapse. The only thing keeping the outer layers of a planet from falling inward are the inner layers of the planet that are holding the outer layers up. Over time, if an object is massive enough, even if it's made out of rock, it will actually settle into a spherical shape. So this is what happened to the dwarf planet Ceres. It's so massive that it has enough gravity pulling in on itself that it formed into a sphere, 
But Eros, on the other hand, does not have enough mass to do that and remains the shape of a foot, roughly this size compared to Ceres, by the way. So the amount of mass is what determines an object's ability to become a sphere, but the speed at which that object ends up spinning also has a great effect on the object's shape. Let's scale down and look at human-sized objects for a moment. I think my favorite illustration of spin affecting shape is this water balloon. It's a sphere when it's not spinning, but add some spin and it immediately becomes a disc. Big kudos to this guy, by the way, here for putting a water balloon on a power drill. So let's look at the Earth. It's an elliptical sphere, right? It's oblate, meaning it's fat at the equator, but skinny from pole to pole. If the Earth spun faster, not only would our days get shorter, but the Earth would actually get fatter. Imagine that. Going back to Jupiter real quick, Jupiter itself spins a complete 360 degree Jupiter day in just 10 hours. That's more than twice as fast as Earth. And guess what? Jupiter is also known as one of the most oblate planets. Just from any accurate picture of it, you can easily see how much fatter it is around its equator than it is tall. Okay, so there's one more thing we have to talk about. Did you know how vastly different the plane of our solar system is to the rest of the galaxy? This view is from North America. And this line here is our solar system's plane. And this line here is the galactic plane of the Milky Way. Our planetary system's invariable plane is so far offset from the galactic plane that it's rather astonishing. In my research, I couldn't find too much speculation on why this is the case. But I can only imagine that when the solar system formed, our protoplanetary disk just happened to start spinning up in this direction while all of the random swirling and collisions were happening. Our galaxy is estimated to be 100 times wider than it is thick. To give it a number, that's 100,000 light years across in diameter, and only 1,000 light years thick. Okay, I'll leave you with one more question. A complete revolution around the center of the galaxy is estimated to take our solar system 250 million years. As the sun travels around the Milky Way, do you think that the plane of our solar system always lines up with the center of the galaxy? Or do you think we do kind of a do si do like this? Line up or do si do? There is a right answer, but what does your intuition tell you? In conclusion, I think it's so cool how self-gravity causes concentrations of matter in the cosmos to spin up and form into stars with disk shapes around them. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world when you just think about Saturn, or when you think about the oblate shapes of our spinning spheres. So if you like this video, subscribe up. But don't click the little bell. People are always saying, click the little bell. Do you really want notifications about galaxy stuff? Well, perhaps click the bell if you want to be up to date on my upcoming video series I'm calling Science Reality. I just wanted to get this video out first because I think it's really important to understand the shape of our solar system before exploring it. I really want my new series to supplement the Everyday Astronauts videos. I'm going to be talking about SpaceX, settlement sustainability, life support, orbital mechanics, and of course, artificial gravity. Thanks for watching, and thanks for those well thought out comments. Small stars out.